Oh boy, do I have a treat for you in this video. Thank you very much for watching my channel. My name is Basim and today we're going to be talking about continuous deployment. This is the third video in the GitHub Actions full course. First video is going to be over here. Second video is going to be over here. Where, wait, here, here, here. This is the third video in the GitHub Actions full course series. You're going to find the first video and the second video in the comments below. Make sure to check them out if you haven't done so already before watching this one. If you are familiar with GitHub Actions, today we're going to be seeing how we can create a continuous deployment workflow. We have a lot to cover, so let's dig right in. So we got ourselves a nice cup of coffee and now we are ready to tackle a complicated subject such as continuous deployment. The complexity is not with using GitHub Actions to achieve continuous deployment. The, the complexity of the, the subject lies in the different variables that you need to consider when you want to implement continuous deployment in your project or set of projects. These variables are many. Let's, let me try to summarize a few of them. So first of all, your software architecture plays a big role in your ability to achieve continuous deployment successfully or not. The second one is the infrastructure that you are using, whether you are uh, deploying to the cloud or you have an on-prem data center that you deploy to, or maybe you deploy to devices. This, the continuous deployment will vary based on your infrastructure. The skill level in your team, right? Both the level of the uh, skill level of the DevOps platform, SRE engineers, whatever you want to call them, as well as the software engineers and even the product and project managers, right? Everyone needs to be on board and have a good understanding of how continuous deployment works. And most importantly, the project managers and anyone who manages the process around building the software, they need to be very uh, aware and capable and, and they have to have a good understanding of how everything works for you to achieve success with continuous deployment. And the last variable is the uh, type of product that you are building, right? So are you building a SaaS software as a service? Are you building a mobile app? Are you building firmware, for example? And other software for manufacturing devices, for example, right? There are so many different uh, products that you can build with software, so many solutions for so many different problems. And the complexity of continuous deployment varies and if i might say here it increases as we go from left to right right so the probably the easiest of the group over here to achieve continuous deployment with is a SaaS solution while mobile apps become a little bit more complicated and firmware uh, and other like you know um, uh, software related to large devices become even more complex. There are obviously many more variables that come into play, but we are going to limit ourselves in this video to those. And we're going to make some assumptions for today. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be able to make a lot of progress. First of all, we're going to assume that the software architecture of whatever we're going to build the continuous deployment pipeline for is one, a monolith, right? Um, Continuous deployment for microservices is way, 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 way more complicated than uh, achieving continuous deployment for a monolith. So we're just going to start with the basics. I will, de I will definitely have future videos covering different aspects of microservices because the complexity increases uh, dramatically when we go from monolith to microservices. Uh, but for now, let's stick to this. The second assumption we're going to make is we are going to be deploying to the cloud and more specifically, we're going to be using AWS uh, to deploy to. And out of AWS, we're going to be using a few simple products. So we're going to be using VPC. We're going to be using EC2 instances, and that's pretty much about it. We're not going to be using containers for this video. We're not going to be using Kubernetes clusters. I will have videos dedicated specifically for Kubernetes containerized deployments and all of that stuff that are coming up part of this course and part of this series. But for now, we're just going to stick with the basics. If you understand the fundamentals, as I always say, the more complicated stuff becomes so much easier. We're not going to comment too much on the skill. We're just going to assume that no one knows anything. So I'm going to treat this video and the demo later on as if you don't know anything um, about AWS. Uh, and you don't know anything about the product that we're deploying. So let's uh, say this is a novice skill level, right? 
And then the last part is we're gonna assume that we are deploying a SaaS, not even a SaaS. It's not even multi-tenant, it's just a simple website, right? Let's call it a website or a, uh, um, let's say a REST, simple REST API, right? That's not going to be a website. Uh, it's going to be a simple REST API, right? And the last thing I want to add here is that the type of deployment we're going to be doing, right? It's going to be a, it's a basic one. So we're going to have three environments. We're going to have the dev environment, which is going to be my laptop, my local development machine, right? This is where I'm going to be writing the code. Then we're going to have a staging environment, right? This is going to be a very basic EC2 server where we're going to deploy for testing purposes. And then we're going to have the production environment. This is basically where we're going to be do the final step of the deployment. This is where clients and whoever is consuming our API, they're going to be calling that environment to get the information from. Now, obviously there are multiple other strategies for continuous deployment, right? So you can do uh, something called blue green, which is also called red, black, whatever you prefer. So, and after that you could have a uh, canary uh, releases and evidently the complexity increases as we go from top to bottom here. Right. Um, and the complexity increases as well as the maturity of, uh, all the different variables, right. Uh, needs to increase for you to be able to achieve these. So start by building simple, you know, setups and then evolve the environment that you have involved, evolve your setup as your software evolves. Don't start doing Canary releases from day one because it's gonna be very complicated to set up and you most likely will not be needing it. If you have the capacity and the experience to do it from day one, go ahead. And if you have the time and, and you know the money for it, because this is gonna cost you a lot in terms of infrastructure and in terms of setup. But if you don't really need it, start simple. And then I think the next logical step after this would be blue green deployments so that you can achieve uh, sort of zero downtime, uh, uh, zero downtime uh, deployments. And from there you can uh, go towards Canary releases where you can deploy to a percentage of your uh, clients uh, or end users, right? You can say, I want to deploy this release to 20% of my user base. And then as you build trust with your release, you can uh, increase that user base and have it more available for a wider audience. Um, I'm going to have, again, future videos discussing these topics. And if I'm not able to do these videos, I'm probably going to refer you to other channels who did a great job explaining these concepts. For now, we're just going to stick to the development staging production environment uh, deployment. If this is not your video, if this is not your first video on my channel, I think my regular viewers are already used to me uh, starting with the basics and we're going to do the same, pretty much the same over here. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the branching strategy we're going to adopt for our project. And there are different branching strategies that you can adopt. Uh, I think I talked about those a little bit more in the uh, continuous integration video. Uh, but for now, we're just going to reiterate very uh, briefly on them. So the two main ones I'm going to talk about are the GitHub flow and the Git flow. Um, the GitHub flow is much more simple than the Git flow, and it can pretty much achieve a lot of different scenarios. So it, no matter what you do, like at GitHub, for example, we have a pretty big monolith and we use the Git flow with the backporting concept. Uh, to achieve the, com the the complexity, sorry, to manage the complexity around um, introducing changes to our software. The Git flow has been introduced years ago, but it was also um, sort of deprecated and not recommended by the original author of the Git flow. It gained a lot of popularity because it promises more than what it can deliver. And in my opinion, this is not a path you want to go down. Uh, you could want to go through because Git flow can become really complicated and it relies heavily on long lived branches and long lived branches is a, is a very bad practice, no matter what you do and no matter what type of project you are building, long lived branches require a lot of maintenance effort. Uh, they make the whole flow much more complicated and they will drastically reduce your ability to deploy faster. The GitHub flow, which is also called the pull request flow will allow you to achieve um, sort of a good, relatively good cadence if you keep things around it uh, as simple as possible. And we're gonna adopt it today to describe our continuous deployment flow. So how would the GitHub flow look like? 
let's assume we have the main branch, the trunk or the master branch, whatever you want to call it. We already have some commits on it, which are basically features that have been introduced previously. And at some point in time, you come in as a developer and you create a, a branch, a new branch out of the main branch. This is called the feature branch so that you can introduce your changes. I have described all of this in much more detail in the continuous integration video. I highly recommend that you watch it if you haven't done so already. So we're going to move a little bit fast here. I create my feature branch in red, and then I start introducing the changes that I would like to introduce. Uh, so let's assume these are represented in three or four commits. And once I am happy with the changes that I have uh, implemented, I can create a pull request, right? So this is going to be a pull request from the feature branch back to the main branch, right? And I have not, uh, obviously I've not merged this pull request yet. So let's just keep it, keep it like this. So the pull request has been created. And when the pull request has been created, we're going to do a bunch of stuff in the video for CI. We talked about doing the CI work, which are building, we're going to build our app. We're going to lint the code base and we're going to run the tests, whether they are integration tests, unit tests, whatever they are. Obviously you can do much more than this. It really depends on the complexity of your project, but this is pretty much the majority of the different cases, right? Also security scanning. So let's not forget that it's important, right? Code scanning, whatever it is that you need to do over here. If we run the CI tests and they are successful, the next step we want to do to add the confidence in our changes, right, is to deploy this, this entire thing into an environment that we can test with. And this is where deploying to staging comes into play and it becomes uh, sort of a, you know, a, a, a need. And how can we achieve this? So there are multiple ways we can do this. Once APR is open, we can pick up this event and we can right away create a new EC2 instance and EC2 think about it as a simple uh, virtual machine that is in the cloud. Sorry, I don't know why the color changed anyway. So think about EC2 as a simple virtual machine that exists in the cloud. It can run any operating system that you desire. And on this virtual machine, you can pretty much deploy your app, uh, right? And then you can serve this, um, application um, to whatever the internet or your internal network or whatever it is that uh, you want allow you want to allow access to right so this doesn't have to be exposed to the internet if you don't want to uh, this could be only limited to your internal audience and then only like certain people can access this because it's a staging environment right this is not our production our production most likely would be exposed to the internet so Think about it as a very simple setup, nothing really fancy going on here. Uh, and if you want to deploy your staging, once we create the pull request, we can just simply pick these changes and sync the code with the, or copy the code to our EC2 instance. And then we, whatever, we start the web server or uh, we just redeploy the app and uh, we should run it again. And this is where you can come in yourself da -da 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 -da, and you can do uh, whatever tests you would like to do on the uh, application, right? Pretty easy, nothing really going on here. However, let me introduce this scenario for you. What if someone else is also working on, on, a, uh, on a feature? So obviously in the team, you're not alone, right? So there are other people who have introduced changes over here. And then one of your colleagues, maybe on in another team has come in here and created a pull request and they have introduced a couple of changes here and they have also gotten to the stage where uh, they have created a pull request of their own. If our pipeline will automatically deploy to our staging environment, as soon as we have a pull request created, this is going to be a problem because your changes are already in this environment here. And then this pull request changes will come in and override the changes that you already have here. That's not nice. That's not what we want. I think we can make it a little bit more complicated than this, right? And what we can do is we can create a new EC2 instance for every pull request that has been created. And I think this is what we want to achieve. 
yes, it's not cost effective. Yes, it will cost you more because every pull request that you have on your project will basically spin up a new uh, instance that is isolated from the other. So let's demonstrate this. It will look like the following. So the, the VPC, let's extend it over here. And then what we will have is that this PR, we will create a very dedicated EC2 instance for it. And the app will be over here. And then we will deploy this uh, pull request into the uh, EC2 instance belonging to it. And once this uh, pull request is merged, we can obviously come in and destroy uh, the EC2 instances that are for staging so that we can reduce the cost. Because in AWS, for example, you pay for what you consume and what you use. If your EC2 instance is down, you don't pay for it. That's it. It's as easy as that. So I think this is better because then we can uh, create a dedicated environment per pull request and we don't block people from, you know, testing things and, and, and moving forward with their changes. Now, what do we do after that? Let's assume that the staging environment has been, the, st the changes in the staging environment have been approved and everything looks fine. Now we want to merge the changes from the pull request into our uh, main branch, right? So let's say me as, as the first user will come in and then I will come in here and merge my changes. Let's say the code review has went fine and everything else was okay. I merge my changes with the, with the main line or main branch, whatever you wanna call it. And again, as I mentioned in the continuous integration video, uh, another series of CI uh, checks will run here. And again, we will build the app, but instead of uh, just building with our changes, we are gonna build with everything that came in, including these two changes here uh, to the main line. We're gonna lint. We're gonna run the unit tests and integration tests. We're gonna do security scans again, right? Basically, this is another level of verification that our changes in addition to everything else that came before it are not breaking. And once the CI stuff is successful, we want to trigger a deployment to production. Now, continuous deployment states that as soon as where well, there are different strategies here, right? So you can automatically deploy anything that gets merged to the main branch directly to production. I personally don't really like that because sometimes things can go, go wrong and you really need some level of control over this. So the way we're going to approach it is by creating a manual trigger. And this manual trigger can be basically triggered by anyone and we're going to feed this manual trigger the commit hash for this here after we merge it with the main line and we're going to ask the workflow or the pipeline to take this along with obviously everything that came in in this pull request and these changes over here and deploy this to production. And just like we did with the staging, we're just gonna take this uh, commit over here, which will include everything that came with it before. And we're gonna deploy this, these changes to our production environment. In this case, we don't really need to create a new EC2 instance in production because obviously uh, we don't want to recreate our environment. You can, if you choose to do so, but this means you have downtime. There are ways to achieve blue-green deployments so that you can have zero downtime, where basically you will have, instead of one EC2 instance, you will have two, and you will deploy to one of them, right? While the second one keeps on serving your end users. So your end users, instead of them being blocked, they will keep on getting their content from this one, while this, uh, uh, this environment gets upgraded. And once the environment upgrade is complete, your user requests will be forwarded uh, again to the environment that has been upgraded. And then next time you wanna deploy another change, uh, you do it uh, in, in the reverse way where this environment gets upgraded first and uh, you know this uh, environment here keeps serving the requests. Again, I'm not gonna go too much into the details here. You just need to know that we keep switching and bouncing back and forth between the two environments that we have to make sure that we never are never interrupted. For now, we're not gonna do blue-green deployments, right? So 
we are gonna accept the downtime and we're gonna be deploying to just one EC2 appliance. Uh, we're gonna minimize that downtime by not recreating the environment. So we're just gonna basically sync files uh, and uh, restart our web server so that the changes are applied. Don't worry, this is all gonna become even easier and much more digestible once you see the demo and you play around with it yourself. So let's jump to that. What I showed you in the first segment is just the essence of continuous deployment. It is the foundation that we're gonna build everything on top of. In practice, you will notice that things are not that simple. And I'm gonna show you also right now in this demo, a few caveats and a few problems that you might bump into in real life. We are not gonna follow exactly the example that I showed previously. So I introduced a few variations because I thought it would be interesting for you to see the more complicated scenarios and what happens if we adopt different types of strategies and what are the trade-offs that we are trying to make when we adopt one way instead of the other. As always, I want you to remember whether it's software engineering or DevOps or whatever area you are trying to solve for, there will always be trade-offs that you have to make. There will always be compromises and there will always be choices that you have to move forward with and accept the consequences of. There will never be a way that solves for everything. For you to get the most out of these videos, you have to be an active learner. You cannot just be a passive recipient of information. Uh, I need you to build these yourself. I need you to explore these yourself. And I need you to copy these examples and implement them on your own and introduce variations to them. This is how you're going to get the most out of this course. Otherwise, it's just going to be a dump of information that you're most likely going to forget in a day or two after watching. Cool, so we're gonna come back to the repository where everything lies. I'm pretty sure you are familiar with this repository now. If you've watched the first and the second video, we're just gonna build on top of what we've done before and we're just gonna continue from where we left off. I think in the previous video, we discussed continuous uh, integration and I showed you the CI workflow that we adopted. You will notice in this video that there are a number of changes to it that I've introduced, uh, specifically on the uh, triggers in the triggers section. I'm gonna explain these changes and why I have introduced them and what's the purpose of them. But first, let's cover a little bit the repository uh, structure one more time, uh, for the, especially for those who are joining this uh, video for the first time. Um, we have the web folder, which contains our simple Node.js web application. It's very, very minor. It has a couple of routes uh, and endpoints uh, that we can just call. Nothing really major going on here. And if we go back to the uh, main uh, root or parent folder, you will see I have the infra folder over here. And this one contains the Terraform uh, files, the Terraform resource files uh, and manifests that I'm gonna be using to build up my staging uh, boxes in AWS, as well as the production instance that I'm gonna be using to deploy this web app to. We're just going to build uh, a bunch of EC2 instances, which are nothing but virtual machines in AWS. And they're going to be running Ubuntu as an operating system. And we're just going to be deploying the web app uh, through syncing the files and running Nginx to serve uh, this web application. I'm not going to dwell too much on how Terraform works in this video. All you got to know is that these Terraform files allow us to spin up and build these instances and make them available for us to use. For now, let's just uh, agree that these folders contain the building blocks for our infrastructure. Uh, and uh, we have the staging environments, we have the production files over here. And let's stick to that. What I'm gonna do first is show you how everything works from a developer perspective. And then we're gonna dig into the details for how this was constructed. So as a developer, let's say I have another account, uh, which is, uh, let's say this one, this is my other GitHub uh, account. It's called Link Ghost. And Link Ghost has decided that uh, he wants to make a change to the web application. And the way we're gonna go about that is we're gonna open the web uh, folder. We're gonna go to routes, and then we're gonna click on index. And we're just gonna make a very minor change over here. We're just gonna say that this endpoint ice flakes which returns a 201 as an http response code and returns this json object is now gonna return <laughs> everything the same way 
but instead of the count being 102, we're going to make the count 205. It doesn't really matter what number we choose uh, as long as uh, we just remember it for a little bit because we're also going to change the unit test to match this count. So I'm not going to be able to commit this directly to main because I use branch protection. I'm going to show you what branch protection is. This is to prevent people from directly committing to uh, your uh, main branch, which we're going to be using for deployment in production. I'm going to name this uh, branch link ghost. Uh, update ice flakes and this is gonna create a, a new branch with this name and also it's gonna ask me to create a pull request for this change and i'm gonna do that right now and i'm gonna update the title of the pull request to say update ice flakes endpoint with a new count again be as descriptive as possible and it's also a very good idea to leave more details about what you've done the changes that you've done here I'm going to create the pull request right now. And this is not the only change I want to make. So I'm going to go back to the code. I'm going to select the branch that I've we've just created because I want to introduce more changes to this. And I'm going to go to web and I'm going to go to tests. I'm going to go to routes.test.js. And you can see here that this test expects the count to be 102, but we already changed that to 205, if I'm not mistaken. And we're going to uh, make the change and we're going to say here, fix unit tests because we don't want our CI to fail. Uh, and I'm going to show you now the first CI one is definitely going to fail because the tests are not uh, correct, right? So before we commit the changes, let's actually see that. So we can go to the actions section over here and we can see that the continuous integration work as well as the code scanning has uh, kicked off uh, for our new uh, branch. Uh, don't don't mind these existing uh, runs over here. They are for my testing that I've done before. This is the latest uh, run. So you can see here that the linter has passed. However, the unit tests is currently running and it seems that it has actually failed. And if we go to the details of why the unit test has failed, we will see that it's most likely because of the mismatch in the count and it's done. If we click on the details, you will see here that the unit test expects the count to be 102, but it has received 205. Let's fix this and let's see what happens again. I'm going to go to the actions tab. Uh, code scanning is still running, which is fine. It doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, and I'm going to commit this cha these changes. What happens if I commit them? If I go to the pull request tab, I will see that now I have another commit added. The first, I have a signal also about the checks that happened that they have failed. And the uh, second signal here is that the checks right now are currently running and we're just going to wait for their outcome. You can see here that I also have a nice view of the checks that are currently in progress and I can click on the details here to see what's happening to each one of them. Based on this view, the run linter has succeeded. The run unit test has also succeeded. If I want to go back to where we were before, I can click on this one here and check that the uh, continuous integration workflow has worked. This is the latest one, 42 seconds ago. And if I click on it, uh, I will see that the unit test has succeeded this time. What happens after we finish these checks? We still have the code scanning. We're waiting on it to complete. Now, from a developer perspective, my tests have succeeded, but I still don't have a lot of confidence in this change, right? I want to test it in an environment. I want to see it uh, in an environment that is as similar as possible to our production environment. So how can I achieve this? I have created another workflow. If I click on the actions tab, which is called the create dev staging environment, and I'm going to click on this one. This workflow is manually triggered. Why? Because I don't want to deploy every single change I make in the pull request to a new environment. I want to, resources are limited. We have a tight budget. We want to create a limited number of staging environments and we want to leave it up to the developer to decide when they really, really need it. And in this case, because it's a change to the endpoints, we really need it. If it was a change to the documentation, for example, we don't really need to deploy that, right? The unit test should be sufficient for us to verify and have confidence in that change. So how do we approach this? 
this is a uh, workflow that has the workflow dispatch event uh, specified on it. So the only way for us to trigger it is by clicking on this button. As you can see here, it's asking us for a pull request number. And that number comes from the, if I click on pull requests over here, you will see that I have a number, number 13. This is the pull request number that it's asking for. And these numbers are unique per pull request. So you will never have two pull requests with the same exact number. Uh, and these numbers uh, are uh, go in an incremental order. And you can also see it over here, which is number 13. So we're gonna provide this number to our workflow here, and we're gonna say run workflow. What this workflow is gonna do is it's gonna create a new box. It's gonna create a new virtual machine in EC2 using Terraform automatically for us. You're gonna see it over here. And then it's gonna take that new pull request and that branch we just created, and it's gonna deploy it to our machine. And it's gonna comment, create a couple of comments on our pull request to say that the changes have been deployed successfully. This is the link with which you can use to verify the new changes in the new box that was created. And for us to confirm what's going on a little bit here, I'm gonna go to my EC2, uh, to my AWS, sorry, uh, cons console, and I'm gonna show you here that I have a staging environment that's already up and running. I have a production environment that's up and running. And if I refresh right now, it's gonna take a little bit of time. Let's see where, we, where it is. Now Terraform is checking what we already have versus what we're gonna be creating. And it's gonna say that, we're gonna create this environment. Again, don't worry too much about it. I'm gonna cover all that in much more detail in a future video. Okay, it seems that we have everything in order. Now it's applying the changes to our AWS and in a bit, we should be able to see the resources. Perfect. Now our new server is uh, being created and if we go to the dashboard and refresh, uh, remove the status, we should be able to see here that our staging CICD demo on the PR number 13 we have a new server that's currently being created. It has a pending state, so it's not finalized yet. Um, now the instance is, is booting up and the changes are gonna be deployed once the new virtual machine is ready. Uh, we can see here that it's still creating the resources. And it's important to say here that when we build this type of workflows, it's very important for us to optimize them as much as possible. Nobody wants to wait for half an hour for resources to be available, right? We want to make sure that within maximum of a few minutes, uh, we have resources available for us to use. And uh, we just want to make sure that our environment is as nimble and as simple as possible for uh, these workflows to run uh, as fast as they can. As you can see here that the changes are currently being deployed to the new box and we are restarting the nginx um, uh, server as well as the pm2 job and i think it's done it's done successfully which is great to see if i go again to my aws dashboard i should be able to see that i have a server with the name of my pr uh, up and running and if i go to my Per request, I should see a couple of comments. Perfect. This is the Terraform changes that have happened as, long, as well as the details of what are the changes that we introduced. It's very important for us to maintain a good uh, command of our infrastructure, right? We don't want to have changes that we don't understand. And uh, my workflow has commented on the pull request with uh, something useful for us. It says that PR number 13 has been deployed successfully. And this is the link that we can use to test. And if I open this link in the new tab, I will be able to see the output from my app, which is fantastic. And if I go to the route ice flakes, I add it forward slash ice flakes, I should be able to get a response. And this response says uh, resources, ice flakes, count 205, shape circle. Fantastic. This is exactly what we would love to see. It means that the changes that we have introduced in the pull request have been successfully deployed to a new box that we have just created. And uh, these are the changes. And we just, again, verified them in the API itself over here. That's the first step of adding more confidence to our pull request. Uh, the second step of adding more confidence is to ask people to uh, review our uh, changes. So I'm going to request 
a review from myself. Obviously, uh, the review is better asked from your colleagues. You can see here that all of the checks have passed, but the merging is still blocked because it still requires one person to verify these changes for us. We're going to do that right now. I'm going to switch over to my other environment. And this is my second account. I'm going to go to the pull request page. I'm going to go to the uh, details here and I'm going to add my review. I'm going to have a look at them. Maybe I want to deploy this on my dev machine, or I could also go and verify these changes myself. Uh, again, in the browser to make sure that everything is working fine. Maybe the quality assurance team would like to do some tests over here. Let's just say that everything is great. There are no changes that are required. I'm going to say looks good to me and we're going to ship it. I'm going to approve these changes and I'm going to submit my review. And as you can see here now, everything is in green. Everything is good to go. Even code scanning has completed successfully and it has returned no uh, security problems with our code. This is <laughs> fantastic. This is what we would love to see normally. And uh, obviously, we're going to leave it to the developer that initiated this pull request to merge. I have specified that I want to keep a linear history. That's why you see here is squash and merge. Uh, I'm going to squash both of these commits into one. And I'm going to add a comment here to say update ice flakes endpoint count to 205 confirm and squash fantastic now our changes have been merged with the main branch our story is not done yet uh, we have merged with the main branch now we need to verify that the main branch is actually has not been corrupted by these changes right because we're not working on this project ourselves or only us we have multiple people working on this project. And if I go to my actions tab one more time, you will see here that I have a bunch of workflows triggered. So first of all, I have the continuous integration workflow because I want to test now. I want to run the unit tests of my change along with all the other changes that have happened or, uh, or are contained already in the main branch. Uh, and I also want to run code scanning one more time because now there are changes. We really don't know what, what has happened, uh, right? So we tested on the pull request level, but now we want to test everything together. And this is why it's important to run these tests again. The ent continuous integration uh, workflow ran and it's successful. The code scanning workflow is currently running. And finally, once we have confidence in everything, we want to deploy this workflow. What we are deploying here is not just the content of the pull request. Now we are deploying the content of the pull request plus all the other changes that are currently in the main branch, which could be completely different than what we have in the pull request branch, right? I think we explained this in the first video because we're not working alone. Um, you will see here that I have this clock uh, icon here next to my continuous deployment workflow. It's because this continuous deployment workflow first deploys to staging, it deploys to the staging environment, which is different from the staging environment we created. This is the fixed staging environment. This is the staging environment that contains everything in the main branch, right? Uh, if I click here, uh, you will see that the deployment steps have happened correctly. How do we verify? Uh, we might want to verify what's uh, that the accuracy of this deployment. So we need to get the link for the staging environment. It's not this one. It's actually this one. Uh, because this is my fixed staging environment. I'm going to go here and I'm going to grab the public DNS. I'm going to click on open address. And this is the perfect time for the different teams in different groups, for example, to run their tests. Maybe they want to run their integration tests. Maybe they want to ask the QA team, quality assurance team to run some manual tests and manual verifications. And this is the another, this is this fixed staging environment endpoint. And if I type in ice, ice flakes over here, Perfect. I see that my changes have been deployed and everything is working great. Now I have even more confidence that my change itself works. My change with everything in the main branch works and everything is ready for us to take it to production. Obviously things can still fail in production because we can never have a 100% 
copy of production and staging. We might have production data that is different. We might have uh, certain dependencies that are installed on production that are not 100% as they are in staging. As best practice, you should always make sure that your staging environment is as close as possible to production. But in reality, this might not always be the case. So we just try our best always to add more and more and more confidence in our changes, but we can never have 100% confidence. That's impossible to have. This uh, deployment to production is gated and it requires an approver. So if I click on this one, it will say that it's waiting for review before applying these changes. And I'm gonna click on review deployments. I'm gonna click that this checkbox here to confirm. And I'm gonna say, this is safe to go to production. And, and then I'm gonna approve. And once I approve this one more time, these changes are gonna be deployed to my production environment. And we're gonna give it a couple of uh, minutes and then we're gonna verify the, these changes in production. And hopefully if everything goes well, this is how you have uh, carried a change from a simple uh, branch to a pull request to your newly created staging environment and then to the fixed staging environment and finally to the production environment after going through all of these different gates and different checks uh, that verify and give you more and more confidence in the changes that you are trying to make. And as you can see here, this has been successfully deployed to production. So if I go back to AWS, my console, and I click on my production server, and then I grab the uh, public uh, DNS, which is the URL with which I can go and call my web server. I'm relieved now to see that this has not been broken. And if I type here ice flakes, uh, I should be able to see that the changes are now in my production environment and we have successfully uh, demoed the entire flow. Awesome. So this looks uh, pre pretty well polished and it worked really well uh, because I spent the past week building it. <laughs> so now I'm going to share how you can build this stuff uh, yourself and how you can approach uh, a, a problem like this. And I'm going to also show you the areas where this, this exact workflow will fail in certain situations and the caveats that you need to uh, keep an eye on if you want to replicate the same workflow in your uh, environment. Remember, we don't, you don't have to replicate these exact same steps. Uh, this is just, again, the, the essence of it and your team might have different needs whenever it comes to continuous deployment. So let's now jump from the demo to talking about how you can implement this. And we're going to dig deep into the workflow YAML files. We're going to go back to the code tab in our repository, and we're going to click on the workflows folder, the .github slash workflows folder. In it, you will see the uh, four workflows that we had demonstrated in a while ago. And the first one is the ci.yaml. I'm not going to dwell too much on the ci.yaml. We saw it in a previous video. Uh, I just want to point out a, an interesting change that I've done which is that now the CI runs on pull requests as well as push events to the main branch. So whenever a pull request is created against the main branch or a push has been done on the main branch, this workflow, workflow will run. And I've added also the path positive filter in the sense that only when changes happen to the folder web and anything inside of it, whether it's files or subfolders, subdirectories, uh, this event will be triggered changes to all of the other files and folders in the repository will be ignored by this workflow. So the CI will not run. Why? Because our web application is contained inside this folder in its entirety. And I don't really want to run the CI every time I introduce a change to the repo because I could be changing the readme files, the documentation, the Terraform uh, um, resource files, and I don't want to run CI. It's just a waste of resources if I do. Uh, because remember, when if you're using github.com and you're using GitHub hosted runners, you're paying by the minute. So the more you run your workflows, the more the higher your bill will be. Uh, the job uh, jobs in it are not changed, so the test job still remains the same. Uh, we're checking out the repository, installing dependencies, and running the unit tests. The linting job is also the same, so not much has changed from a CI perspective. Next, we're gonna jump to the uh, first complicated workflow or the most complicated workflow in all of this demo, which is the creation of the staging environments 
on demand, right? So this is contained in the staging.yaml file. Bear with me, there's a lot to go through over here. So, uh, and let's start with the event that triggers this entire workflow, which is the workflow dispatch. A workflow dispatch event, as I mentioned, is an event that comes after you click on the run workflow button. And a nice feature of workflow dispatch is that you can uh, ask for inputs. And in this case, I'm asking for the PR number. Why? Because I cannot derive the PR number from the context of the event, which usually comes as part of the uh, workflow run, because this is not an event that runs as a consequence to a pull request, right? The pull request has been created. And after that, we are manually triggering this, this workflow. That's why we need the pull request number for us to do then the steps that we're gonna do next. Once we have the pull request number, uh, we have the first job or the only job, which is the create job. And uh, it runs on a Ubuntu latest, nothing really out of the ordinary here. And then we go into the steps of that job. The first step is very important. Uh, we need to first verify that this PR is actually correct and that it belongs to an open PR because you could pretty much enter any number here. And uh, we wanna make sure that um, we add some verification, right? And of course, this step, you can augment it to become as complicated as you need it to be. This is very basic verification that I'm doing right here. And the nice thing about this step is that I'm using a very cool uh, action, which is called GitHub script. And GitHub script uh, basically bootstraps the runner with uh, the uh, Node.js library, which allows you to write uh, JavaScript code in this multi-line uh, statement over here. And using this multi-line uh, segment, you can pretty much call any API endpoint on GitHub and either fetch information, introduce changes, or pretty much do whatever you want on the repository level. Of course, this action also takes in as a secret the GitHub token, and we're providing it with the GitHub token that is created for this workflow run, which only has access read and write access to this repository. So you cannot, for example, make changes from here to other repositories or call APIs that are outside of the scope of this token. You will get permission denied and you will not really, you will not go anywhere. So what are we doing in this script? We are creating a constant called response and we are calling the uh, pulls API, which basically allows us to fetch information about the pull request. We are providing the repository name, uh, sorry, the owner of the repo, uh, as well as the repository name and the number that we have gotten from the input of the workflow dispatch, right? And after that, we are we are using a wait because this is an asynchronous call. This, this method returns a promise. So we're gonna wait for the outcome of this API call before we move on to the next step. And the next thing we are doing is we are comparing the number right, of the, that comes as part of the response, because when we say get pull request information, it's gonna get a lot of information for the pull request. And actually, let me show you uh, how the response looks like. So as usual, I went to the uh, github.com uh, documentation or the docs, and I uh, went to the get pull request uh, segment. And if I scroll down a little bit, you will see here the response that comes as part of, uh, after calling this workflow, uh, sorry, this API endpoint. And in the response, I get uh, as part of the main object number, which is the pull request number. And this is the number we're comparing against, right? So if you go back here, response.data.number, because number is on the highest level, uh, we fetch it and then we compare it to the input that was provided. Uh, if the PR number is incorrect or the PR does not exist, we're not gonna get a 200 and we're not gonna get that payload that you just saw. We're gonna get a 404 probably or something similar or unauthorized. And um, this check here will fail. And if it does, it will throw an error and the workflow will not proceed beyond this point because it threw an error. Otherwise, if this check passes, uh, that means we have the correct uh, pull request. And what we need from it is also to get the branch that is associated with this pull request. And the way we get it is by accessing the head and then ref objects, the head object and then the ref property for that object. So if we scroll down in the pull request payload, we should be able to get to head, which is, uh, which is over here. And then you can see that the ref uh, contains the uh, branch name. Now, 
Once we have that branch name, we are returning it because we're going to be needing this branch name in the next steps. Next step after this, this one is to check out the repository with the branch. We're passing here the branch name that we want to check out, right? So by default, it will check the default or the main branch. We don't want that in this case. Why? Because the Terraform files, they are located in the branch called infra. They are not, they are also located in the branch called main. This is a subtlety that I'm not really gonna go through the, at this point. And it's one of the caveats of this workflow. I need to use the infra branch to introduce changes to Terraform. And this is because I'm including my Terraform scripts along with my web application. This is a very bad practice and I really, really do not recommend it. Uh, it's just, I wanted to have this entire demo inside one repository and I did not really want to split it. However, if you want to approach this, I highly recommend that you maintain Terraform in a separate repository because first of all, you need separation of concerns. Managing infrastructure has nothing to do with your application. You need to keep it close to your application, but not in the same repository. Um, there is nothing good that comes out of maintaining your infra in the same repository. Some people might argue against, or sorry, argue for it. I'm not... I'm not of the opinion that you should maintain your infra files in your uh, web app or in the repository containing your application. It should be separate. Now, beyond this subtlety, I'm going to come back to it when we discuss Terraform. For now, let's just agree that the infrastructure files are contained in a branch called infra and my um, web application is contained in either the feature branches or the main branch. Next. I'm going to be calling this step to set up Terraform. Again, forget it for now. This is just installing the Terraform uh, binary so that I can execute Terraform changes. And then I am creating the new resource file for my staging environment. I have uh, created a custom script, uh, which will basically copy an example file and then do some modifications inside, inside that example file. And then it will pass a unique identifier, which is the PR underscore pull request number in this case, because each pull request is unique. And then what this will do is that it will create a resource file uh, that is unique to the new staging environment I wanna create. And then it returns the name of that resource because we're gonna need that resource name in the next steps as well. Here we are asking Terraform to initialize and validate our uh, resource file definitions. This is important because we don't want the next steps to fail. They are very expensive in terms of time. So we want to make sure that we fail as early as possible. Next step is to call the Terraform plan. Terraform plan will basically check our configuration, our new configuration, which is contained in files against the state and against what we actually have in AWS. And it will introduce uh, the changes as they are in our files to AWS. So basically the version of truth is always going to be, or the state that we always want to go towards is going to be contained in our files. And then what is available in AWS is going to mimic the definition that we have in our uh, resource files. Uh, once this plan is completed, we are going to update the pull request. This is where you saw the first comment in the pull request, right? We saw a message. And this is the uh, step that actually writes that message. We are again using GitHub script for that. And we are uh, passing the message and the content of the Terraform plan, as you can see over here. Nothing really major going on here. We're just defining a uh, constant or a variable which contains the body or the payload of the comment that we would like to write on the pull request. Then we are uh, defining who is making this change and what is the action that triggered this change. And once we have all the information, we are going to make a call to the GitHub APIs to insert or create a comment on the pull request. Uh, next, uh, we are adding and introducing a step also to fail early. If the Terraform plan fails for whatever reason, we want, it, we want to exit the workflow and we don't want to proceed with applying the changes. Now, an, an important step of Terraform is when it applies the changes. This is when Terraform basically reads the files and applies the plan that we have uh, generated in the previous step. And by applying it, that means creating the resources on AWS. Once we have created the resources, we would like to fetch the DNS, the public DNS of our EC2 instance that we've created. And we can do that by calling uh, the Terraform output command and extracting from it uh, the DNS of the resource we created previously. If everything goes according to plan, 
Uh, Terraform is stateful, which means that we have to maintain the files or the, 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 the definition files, the resource files uh, somewhere. And we are using this repository to maintain them. That's why we are gonna commit these changes. Why? Because we created a new resource file, right? So now we have to store it somewhere. We're gonna commit these changes back into our infra branch because the branch is already checked out. So all we have to do here is just to specify the actor or add the username and email for Git because Git is not configured with those in the runner. We are going to set the remote uh, for this uh, repository uh, copy. And then we're gonna add the Terraform files, all the Terraform files or all the files that end with the .tf extension anywhere in all of the subdirectories from the parent uh, directory. And then we're gonna commit the changes and then we're gonna push them. You will see here that I added a nice little trick, which is something you will bump into if you build any pipelines in the future, which is that git push, if it does not find anything to push, uh, it will exit with non-zero status. Exiting with non-zero status will cause our workflow to fail. In this case, not having anything to push it's not a bad problem because what if we run this workflow multiple times and the PR is still open? This is not going to create a new file. This is not going to change anything in the infrastructure of Terraform, but we still want to, the whole workflow to complete and we want to allow uh, the redeployment of the changes, right? Because in the future steps, we're going to deploy changes. So what if we want to rerun this workflow to redeploy changes? This guarantees that if we have nothing to, uh, to push in terms of uh, changes to the infra branch, this step will not fail, right? Obviously we can add another, there's another way to do it, which is the continue if error equals true statement, which we can add to the step over here. But I wanted to introduce this nice little trick to show you how you can leverage bash properties. In this case, the or uh, uh, operator uh, to go around certain things, right? Now, once we have push, pushed the changes, we are actually going to check out the branch of our pull request. Why? Because now we want the changes that are in the pull request because we want to deploy those, right? So we use the actions checkout action and we specify this time the uh, branch reference uh, or branch name as we have extracted it from the first step in this workflow, right? If you remember, in the first step at the top, we had the PR number and we called the, we used the GitHub script action to fetch the uh, payload for that or to fetch the details of that pull request. And part of the details is the branch name uh, for that pull request. Once we have that, we pass it to the actions checkout and we check out that particular branch. Once we have the content of that branch on our runner, we are using this community action, which is called rsync deployments. It's a very nice uh, action created by Burnett01. And uh, what this action will do is that it will uh, set up a Docker container. This is a Docker action. And inside that Docker container, it will have rsync installed because rsync um, is not available on these runners, on the GitHub hosted runners. And then what it will do is using the uh, DNS, the public DNS of our uh, environment that we created in the previous steps, along with uh, some of the secrets that I've created. I'm going to show you where, where the secrets are located. One of the secrets is the username we're going to use to connect to that server. The second secret is the SSH private key, right? Because when we created the EC2 instance, we also provided AWS with a public private key pair. And I have added the private key as a secret to this repository. And using the private key, I will be able to SSH into that machine and introduce changes. And rsync has the capacity to do rsync over SSH, which is really nice. That's why we are providing it with these, with these uh, secrets. And using these secrets, uh, it will SSH into the machine and it will uh, basically um, rsync the web folder, right, from our uh, runner into the forward slash var forward slash app folder in our EC2 machine. Why is it this path? Because that's how I configured the image for the EC2 appliance. And again, I'm going to go much more into the detail of how you can set up your own custom images for EC2 instances that you can create. 
and the image already has nginx installed it already has pm2 it has already a uh, node installed it's updated fully patched so on and so forth let's just agree that the application resides in the var app folder or directory on our ec2 instance and we're just gonna rsync the files and a very important property here that you need to be aware of is that this has the delete parameter which means that before it copies the files from our runner to the uh, appliance it will delete everything that is on the appliance already why because i always want to deploy fresh to my uh, instances and i don't want anything to exist on them when i deploy obviously this is not always a desired or an intended uh setup but the this will help you down the line as a best practice to always deploy uh, clean setups this way if there's a problem with the setup you will immediately be able to identify it while sometimes the app or the deployment might fail silently because you already have some properties on the machine already that are sort of interfering with your current deployment so as a good practice always try to deploy to a clean instance and try to delete anything that is already on it uh, uh, so that you can deploy fresh. Once that is done, we are using another community action, which is called action-ssh. This is a very cool action, which allows you to SSH into the appliance and execute some SSH commands on it. The commands I am executing are uh, going into the var app for slash web directory. I'm running npm CI because I want to install the dependencies over there after copying the files. And then I want to start node web server basically using PM2 because I want it to be a background process. And then I am restarting Nginx. Once this step is completed, I am updating my uh, pull request one more time with the message pull request number X has been deployed successfully. And I am providing the URL for my newly created staging environment. Why? So that I can make it easier for my users. They can just click on URL and start testing. I am using the same method as before, which is calling the GitHub script action. And I am calling the uh, issues create comment API. And once that is done, I have a nice little trick towards the end, which is using teammate. Teammate is really cool. It's a, a method that allows you to uh, share your terminal with other users. And I am using this neat little trick uh, because if my workflow fails for whatever reason, uh, teammate allows me to uh, it pro provide me with, a, with an SSH command that I can use to SSH into my runner, which is the GitHub hosted runner, right? By default, you don't have access via SSH to that runner. So this will give me SSH access to the runner and then I can run some commands, troubleshoot, read the logs, see what really has happened there. If the logs that are provided through the workflow run are not sufficient, for me to troubleshoot or diagnose the error or the problem, right? And this will only kick off if any of the steps before this step have failed. So if failure works that way, uh, this condition right here, if any of the steps before fail, it will jump directly to this step and it will run this action slash uh, dash teammate uh, community action. And that's it for this workflow. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to refine it, make sure everything works as, uh, as needed and cover some of the edge cases. After this workflow, we are going to jump to the continuous deployment and I'm going to show you how you can create the uh, gated deployment. Just a small thing before we talk about the continuous deployment workflow, I want to show you where you can add your secrets. So if you go to the settings tab over here and then you scroll down, you will see you have a secrets uh, tab which you can click on and then you will get to the place where you can define your secrets uh, you can create multiple types of secrets here so there are the repository secrets and then there are the environment related secrets i'm going to talk about environments in a bit for now the workflow relies on the repository secrets the workflow that i just showed you which are the remote user ssh private key and terraform api key and you can create those by clicking on the button right here new repository secret and then you enter the secret name right over here and then you add the secrets content and be careful this secret is read only so once you create it you can only update it you can delete it but you cannot fetch the value one more time. These secrets are encrypted and they are stored in GitHub and nobody has access to those secrets except when they are fetched for your workflows. So there are definitely mechanisms to sniff secrets from a workflow. We're not gonna talk about those right now. Uh, all I'm trying to tell you over here is that if you forget the value of these secrets right here, you're not gonna be able to fetch them and your only way to move forward is by rotating these secrets.
Now, let's jump to the continuous deployment workflow. And again, as we've done before, we go to the GitHub slash workflows file, and then we go this time to the cd.yaml file. And here, we already covered the complicated workflow. This one is not going to be that, uh, that difficult. Again, this workflow responds to the push event, this time only on the main branch and only for the content of the web folder. Why? Because I only want to deploy the main branch to production. This will guarantee that everything that I have in the main branch is always in my production environment. If I have a problem in my production environment, I can always redeploy the content of my main branch to make sure that uh, I can recover from a disastrous failure or whatever, right? And this is also a best practice that you always need to uh, keep in mind, which is you want to have a branch that is always or that always has similar content to your production environment because you never know what could happen. Uh, the failure might not necessarily be due to a deployment problem. It could be a catastrophic cascading failure of services. And if you want to bring them back up again, your environment should be uh, replicable. It should be, you should be able to recover from the content of your repository. And uh, of course, production data is another story. I'm just talking about the application now, right? Uh, that's why it's important to have the main branch to be in sync with whatever we have in production. This will make it much easier for you than to do some, you know, branch wrangling or cherry picking or creating another release. You want to really keep it as simple as possible and uh, keep the whole deployment process very, very lightweight. That's also another best practice. And also, I, I, uh, this uh, workflow responds to the workflow dispatch event. Why? Because if I have a problem with the deployment, I would like to be able to run the deployment uh, manually whenever I desire. So let's say something fails for whatever reason, then I fix that failure in my infrastructure. And after that, I want to have the ability to deploy again. And I don't want to create, to push to my main branch to be able to deploy. I want to have the capacity to execute this deployment on demand using the workflow dispatch. All right, this is it about the events. Now we jump to the jobs. The jobs are not really doing anything different than what we just described in the uh, staging workflow. Uh, we are deploying to the staging environment. And in this case, you will see something new here, which we did not talk about before, which is the environment expression over here, right? And I'm providing it with staging. Environments feature in GitHub is really, really cool. It allows you to create uh, sort of an abstraction of an environment. And in that environment, you can add secrets that are only available for the jobs that um, basically add the environment uh, uh, expression to them or uh, parameter or property to them, right? Um, these secrets will not be available for the jobs that do not add the property for them. Uh, how do you create them? Let's jump a little bit again uh, to the settings tab. I have the workflow, I have the repository uh, over here. You click on settings and then you click on environments and then you can click on this button to create a new environment. And it's simple, you just give it a name. So you, let's say we can call this one uh, dev, whatever, I'm gonna delete it in a bit. And in the environment configuration, you can add protection rules. And this is really cool because you don't want anyone to be able to deploy to your environments, right? Sometimes you want people to review and approve a deployment to a certain environment. And this is obviously something you want for your production environment, for example. You can add here up to six reviewers. Uh, they need to be uh, people, these could be people or teams. So if you, so obviously it can grow beyond six people. You can have up to six teams and each team can have up to uh, X number of um, members. Next, you, you have the capacity to add a wait timer. This will basically prevent people from doing deployments one after the other. Why? Because uh, when you deploy to production, you want to monitor that deployment for a bit before you deploy something else, right? And you don't want people to deploy stuff right after each other because you want to, what if something fails? You cannot, you're not going to be able to troubleshoot what is the root cause of the failure if you have multiple deployments that happen sequentially. You might be able to, of course, but it will be more difficult. Uh, that's why you can add a wait timer here to prevent people from deploying uh, very rapidly in a, in a succession. Uh, I'm not going to add it right here. And then you can also specify which uh, branches you're going to allow in this environment, right? So you don't want to deploy all sorts of branches to different environments. Maybe you want to limit it to protected branches or you want to specify exactly which branch uh, can deploy to this particular environment. 
and I have specified the main branch to only, uh, sorry, I have specified only the main branch to be allowed to deploy to staging or production. And finally, just as we added the repository secrets, you can add secrets that are specific for the environment that you are trying to deploy to. Now, as you can see here in my configuration, I'm going to de delete the dev because I don't need it. I already, I have already created the staging environment and the production environment. The staging environment only has uh, one protection rule, which is the, uh, which is the uh, main branch protection in the sense that I'm only allowing deployments from the main branch. And then I, I have added the three secrets, secrets, which are the host name, remote user, and SSH private key. I have the host name here because my staging environment is static, so it's not being recreated every time. It's always available. Uh, that's why I, I have the host name uh, and the ability to add it here as a secret. The production is not very different, but with one small um, distinction is that the production environment requires a review from Link Ghost every time I want to deploy to it. Even if Link Ghost is the person trying to deploy to production, it will require a review from uh, this account. And uh, here I also have the main branch pinned and I have the environment secrets. And obviously here the host name will be the host name for my production environment as opposed to uh, the staging environment. Now let's go back to the workflow. Uh, you can specify which environment you want to deploy to by providing this parameter over here. And then here we are uh, simply checking out the repository, the main branch, obviously, which is uh, done by default. And then we are deploying to staging. Same thing, we're just simply using the secrets to rsync, delete, and copy the files from the web folder into our staging environment. And then we are running these SSH, uh, we are running these commands to restart the Nginx service. One more time, we are doing the uh, deployment to production. And as you can see here, I also added one small thing. We've seen it before. Uh, we are making the deploy to production stage dependent on the deployment to staging. Why? Because I don't want people to be able to deploy to production without first testing it in the static staging environment. So even though they might not want to create a, a specific staging environment to test their changes in, I still want to gate their ability to deploy to production by forcing them to test it in staging. And this will uh, this will elevate the level of confidence I have in my deployments because if, if they are forced to deploy to staging first, if they break staging, that's a signal for them and for many other people that this release or this change is not really ready to go into production yet. So that's why we have this uh, extra gate over here. And as usual in the steps, we're not really doing much, anything different. Uh, we're just repeating the same exact steps as before. In future videos, there's a new feature that has been released, which is called the reusable workflows. Reusable workflows are really, really cool because I don't have to repeat myself. I have repeated probably these steps in three distinct workflows. In future videos, I'm gonna show you how you can write them once and reuse them across multiple workflows. It's a really cool feature, highly in demand, and uh, I did not get the chance to adopt it in this video, but I'm pre I, I will do that in, in future ones. And this is it for the continuous deployment workflow. I've already showed you how it works, and I'm not really sure there's much, there's anything else to cover other than what we discussed so far. One last thing before we wrap up, if we go back to the uh, code uh, tab in our repository, if we scroll down a little bit, you can see here this nice little uh, fragment or nice little view, which shows us our production and staging environments. And this is uh, an association with the environments feature that I, I talked about. And if you click on one of them, it will show you all of the deployments, the deployment line and the history of deployments that have happened on this environment, along with the branch that was deployed and the pull request number that was deployed also in that environment. And it shows you who approved or who did that deployment and when it happened. I think this is really cool because it allows us to keep track and have a, a history of uh, the different deployments that happened in different environments. If you click on deployments over here, you're able to see the different deployment histories for the different environments you have. And staging will most likely look quite similar to what we had in production. 
You might have noticed these badges over here. Uh, I want to show you how you can create them. These are really cool. So if you go to the actions tab and you pick a specific workflow, like the continuous deployment, for example, you can click on this uh, three dots over here and you can create a status badge and you can select the branch that you'd like to the status badge to reflect right whether it's passing failing so on and so forth and then you will have the markdown status badge over here you can copy it and add it to your readme file and you will have these cool badges uh, be part of your uh, readme this is also a nice uh, little feature that uh, was introduced uh, with actions that is everything i had for you regarding continuous deployment if you have watched this full video Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are the people that make this all worth it. I hope I was able to share with you knowledge and information that you did not uh, previously have. And if you are familiar with these topics, I hope I was able to share with you some use cases and scenarios uh, that are new to you. Of course, this is not the end of the series. The next episode is gonna be about infrastructure as code. And we're gonna talk more about Terraform and Terraform Cloud uh, more specifically. We're gonna brush upon uh, the other stuff like cloud formation, CDK, so on and so forth. We're not gonna go in depth into those because I'm personally, I'm a big fan of Terraform. That's the only reason why we're doing Terraform. Uh, I think it's very uh, easy to use and it, it's very powerful. Even though it is stateful, we're gonna talk about what that means uh, in that episode uh, right then and there. This video is gonna come out sometime in December. So if I don't get the chance to release another video in December, I wanna wish you Merry Christmas for those who observe it and a happy new year as well. I, I know that the past year has not been easy on anyone and I hope that the new year will bring you much more happiness and it will bring you whatever you deserve. If you like my channel and if you like my content, hit that subscribe button. That really helps me and it keeps me motivated to make more content for you. I want to be a critical part of your learning journey and I wanna share as much experience as I have with you so that you can accelerate your career as fast as you can and you attain the goals and objectives that you have set for yourself. Until next time, my name is Basim and this is Glitch.